All right, folks, I'm Rich Folley. You're watching PBS Book View Now, and we're live at the Miami Book Fair 2016. We've been live all day with an incredible array of authors, and there's more to come. But first, right now, we have Gail Foreman, who's the author of Leave Me, which I have in my hand, and Emily Giffen for her new novel, First Comes Love. We brought you onto the set together. You both appeared earlier together yeah, as well. Yeah, we did. Had a, a good very, time. Very yeah. fun panel. That is a fun panel. You also were with Maria Semple, yes. maybe? Yes. Yeah. I don't know how you contained all that in one room, actually, all that <laughs> energy and excitement. It was vibrating. Yes. Uh, both of your books are doing so well right now, and I think that it's a really interesting combination. Um, did you guys know each other, first of all, before you met on this panel? I mean, I know Gail's work, yeah. but it's the first time I've met her today. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah, I've been we reading both your work for a while, so. I was talking with Gail earlier about her book, Leave Me, and I was talking about how um, I think that the natural assumption is the book like yours, and yours, Emily, is our written for women, and yet I read both of your books and find that there's something in there for people. And I wonder sometimes about the idea of women's fiction and that sort of designation in, in general, that it, it might put some of these books in a box, because maybe, maybe, just maybe, that there's a good reason why we should all be reading other books outside of our sort of lane, so to speak. What do you think about that term, um, women's fiction, which seems to have replaced other terms in terms of how they sort of categorize books? And I'll start with you, Gail. You know, I'm, I think I'm as guilty of putting things in a box as anyone because in talking about Leave Me, there's been this sort of assumption that because it's about a working mother who sort of is losing her mind, that the natural audience is other mothers. But last week, I, a friend of mine read it, and he's a father, and he was saying that he was dog-earing pages so he and his wife could sit down and talk about it, and really for the first time thought about how it's about modern families and how we're kind of struggling with the new normals, and it's really not enough for just one of the parents to be reading it. Yeah. And Emily, yours is about sisters, but there's obviously that sort of familial relationship between two women in a family. Talk about how that sort of, I mean, obviously one would think natural assumption and most of your readers are women. Do you have men readers as well? I'd like to think that some men do read my books, but you know, my books are relationship driven. So there's two sisters in this story, but it's set in the context of a family. And I think the assumption that women care more about relationships than men is, um, you know, sort of a ridiculous one. Men comprise half of the relationships in my books. Um, and so um, I think it really comes down to just a question of, do you, do you enjoy fiction? Right. I think if, what I've heard, a lot of men prefer nonfiction, or 80% of novels are read by women. Have you heard that before? Regardless of genre. So maybe that's just the marketing yeah. angle there. Could, could be. Let's talk about your book for a little bit, okay. just the story itself. Um, obviously, you... It's about two sisters and the, and the relationship that becomes splintered. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked before, but you've talked a little bit about how, how you were always drawn to sister stories. Why? What is it about sister stories that are so interesting to you? The first time I ever talked about this book was with you. Do you right. remember that? Yeah, I do. Yes. <laughs> it was a book expo uh, before America, my, Before Chicago. my book tour, and this is after my book tour. So, so what do you think um, now? Has it changed? Has your thoughts changed? Well, you book? know, you, you caught me in the very first interview, and now I haven't, uh, haven't been and thinking about it as much because I'm into the new world. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the sister relationship is such an intense one. I think women relationships, period, friendships are intense. And then when you layer on top of it that family dynamic um, and the fact that you as... Um, you know, I, I have a sister, she's one year older, and you know, we are so close yet capable of really misunderstanding each other. And I think that happens and it's a, it's a funny thing in families. Um, I think maybe because you're raised together, you have the same nature, you have the same nurture, there should, there's this assumption that you should see the world the same way. And it, it doesn't always happen, or often it doesn't happen like that, and it certainly didn't for Josie and Meredith in First Comes Love. Yeah. There is an intensity to the relationships between women and in, and in the way women feel relationships with their family, and Gail, that's really your book, and leave me, and I don't think that it, the, the, the mother in the family feels so much pressure to be everything to her family, and it drives her to a point where she just can't handle it anymore, and when she gets sick, when she comes back, you'd think that there'd be some sort of relief, but in fact, it goes right back. It snaps right back to that assumption that the mother, the woman is going to take care of everything in the family. That sort of intensity of feeling, is it something, uh, you know, when you were thinking about that, that you think applies to many other women, obviously, and I, as, cause I think about it in my family, how much pressure I put on my wife to keep things together while I go work on things, whatever those things are. There's absolutely, there's kind of the societal pressure, just kind of the, the default assumption that the mother will be the caretaker of the family, and then that's internalized as well. So even in a situation where, you know, a woman like Mary Beth very well could sort of say, I can't do this and ask for help, 
she does not even feel entitled to, to go to, to that length because she is so strangled by all of the expectations that are upon her, including the ones that she puts on herself. So one of the reasons that she has to run away is not just that her health is in jeopardy, but to upend those expectations by doing this incredibly shocking thing. Yeah, and I think it's sometimes a surprise when that snap happens for uh, the other people in the family or for the husband or whoever, because there's just an assumption that everything's being held together and that it's always going to be together. Um, and yet when it happens, um, we're surprised. We're like, how could that have happened? What's going on there? And I think that it has something to do, I think, with... Um, Again, that sort of, you don't quite understand the sort of pressures that are on women. I think men, I'm speaking from as a man myself, um, and this election has sort of intensified that feeling for me that the sort of a pressures that are on women in general, the way they think about relationships, the depth, the intensity of those relationships to some degree. Right. It's funny because when I was working on this book, so many mothers and women expressed to me that they wanted to run away and, and fathers didn't. And it got me thinking, so what's the deal there? Because I know a lot of fathers who say, I'm very involved in the children's, in the children's life. And I will say, well, what's the name of the dentist? Who's a pediatrician? Like, which, which kid can't your kid play with because the friendship is so toxic? And they're like, so I think that there's that added element. It's not just that second shift of the domestic, but it's the emotional labor that falls on the women. And I think that is really the thing that makes us snap because it's unending. Mm -hmm. How do you build that into your stories too, Emily? I mean, obviously there's, there's an, as you said, an intensity to your characters. Mm -hmm. Well, I have an interesting, a different dynamic. My, my husband's a stay-at-home father, and he's the one that will say to me, you know, this is not the day for soccer, and we've got to pack this. So, and, but it, it's flipped. So I, I've seen it from both sides, and it's very, it's very funny when he is with other stay-at-home mothers. He'll say like, to the husband, dude, you have no idea. By the time you get home and get your workout in and get your shower in and run a couple errands, it's time to pick up again. So um, there's great empathy there on, on, on his side with that. Um, and, you know, I would say that just the, the broader theme here is that relationships are so tough. Marriage is so tough. Um, uh, family relationships are hard and it's, they require an enormous amount of understanding and work. And, you know, whatever, whatever's happening in your house, whatever those layers are, you know, my husband will say, I'm checked out for the, I'm, I'm done for the night. And the kids and I will be like, oh, geez, <laughs> okay, <so bad>. yeah. <laughs> nice attitude problem. We could load the dishwasher without your help. But, um, but I've been on the other end of it too. So it's just, it's, it's, you know, we talked in our panel about how important that is to just have sort of empathy and, and constantly work on your relationships. I think that's it. And with, because with, there's a relationship that with, um, Mary Beth and her best friend Elizabeth that reminded me of the two sisters. It was a deep intensity and when things blow up, it's incredibly painful. And any relationship that is that, is that important, you can't just put it on autopilot. Mm -hmm. If you do, bad things right. happen and then there's these, these dust-ups or things that you've left buried, they, you finally have to deal with them and a relationship's renewed. And I think that that's sort of how familial and, and marital relationships work over time. And the more you care, the more you love someone, the more you're invested in it, the higher the, you know, the higher the stakes are, and the more capable you are, I think, of hurting those people. So if you think about your greatest regrets in life, it's typically not with you know a casual acquaintance. It's more that you said something to hurt someone that you who you truly love, or that you didn't put enough effort into a certain relationship. And um, I think there's so much to draw on in, in that way. Yeah, I think the the idea of caring a lot. So sometimes you sort of take things for granted. You care so much that you just assume that no matter what, that they're going to be understanding, everything's going to be fine, and you're going to forgive my right. transgressions or my problems or the things that I don't do quite well enough or maybe I don't try hard enough today. Um, but in fact, sometimes they build up and that snap will happen or the relationship will break. Mm -hmm. And they see your truest, ugliest self, right? So you don't sugarcoat it. That's right. You just, right? Yep. Yeah, I, I need to work on that. This is making yeah, you need me feel to work on guilty on it. Maybe this is my session with you guys, like getting it all out. But is there a bigger word, though, this election season than the word empathy? Is it overused? I see, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of pressure on books to be the, that empathy driver today mm -hmm. about opening your eyes to other people's worlds and, and doing that. And I think books do solve that problem. I do think they are one of the answers as we go forward. Mm -hmm. But that word is everywhere. I'm not so sure everyone always knows exactly what it means, but it's certainly thrown around a lot as one of the, one of the, one of the answers to, to everything, like to uh, cultural differences, to religious differences, to male-female dynamics. And both of you guys have mentioned the word empathy today. What does it mean to you in your life, Emily? And then I want to 
hear from Gail too. Well, I think it's being thrown. I, I, I do believe it is the cornerstone to everything. I do believe it is the answer to everything. I mean, I, I think it might sound like an oversimplification, but if we did that, if everyone did that, you know, um, the only thing is it's hard to have empathy for someone who doesn't care about, about your feelings. It's like, it's, it's such a two-way, it's such a two-way street right now a, a, in the context of this election season, I would say. Um, There's an opportunity though to like sort of maybe change that tone a little bit. And I'm not necessarily saying normalize everything and say we're on this new great path, it's all going to work <laughs> out. But I, I do think there's an opportunity to say, um, I understand that there's differences of opinion. I understand that there are differences in, human, in, in, in Americans, um, that people have different religions, that people have different concerns. Um, we haven't heard that exactly yet, but it seems like just even just any outreach at all is going to go a long way to what's happening right now. You know, when we first came in, you asked, oh, you know, this categorization of these books as, as women's literature. The problem that I have with that is that it's walling off an experience. And there's been a tradition in American literature where the, the kind of the norm and the experience that everybody is, is sort of expected and it's, it's normal to enter is that of like the white guy. And anything else, like if you're reading a woman's book, a book about women, well, you must be a woman. If you're reading about African-Americans, well, obviously then you're African-Americans. Otherwise, why would you enter that world? And the point that men have a lot to gain from Emily's books or my books because they'll maybe understand relationships that they're in or what their, their wife is going through. I think that that sort of speaks to a broader issue that we have where we kind of wall ourselves off with our experience and only want to see it kind of reflected in those echo, echo chambers that mm -hmm. we keep hearing about. So yes, empathy, like everything can kind of get tokenized, but there is this ability to realize that the way that you experience the world is not universal and in some ways is universal. Are, are either one of you um, people that will, are stepping away from social media, for instance? It's such an important tool, obviously, for writers and authors, and yet you're seeing so many people saying, um, I'm taking a break. I mean, on both sides of the equation in this election, mm -hmm. by the way, I'm taking a break from social media. I'm finding it toxic or upsetting, or I'm learning more about my, my relatives and neighbors than I want, or I'm just getting one side of the equation. Some people are actually taking that active step. Mm -hmm. What is your thoughts about social media in general right now? Well, this is the first time I've ever posted politically, so I'm sort of doing the opposite. <laughs> um, you know, I've always, I, I've always tried to sort of separate social media for, with, you, you know, my, my Facebook, my Instagram, just sort of happy posting, trying to stay away from controversy, but I think it's really important to talk respectfully right now. Um, I think the key is to be respectful and, um, yeah, as long as you're doing that, I think it's better to talk than to not talk. So yeah. I'm, I'm on there. So I have a secret. I have been, I had been off social media for about a year and a half, particularly Twitter, because I realized that it brought out elements of me like that, that I'd rather, we all have our, our better angels and our worse angels and Twitter seemed to bring out my worse angels. So I was off Twitter for about a year and a half and I came back on to, to promote Leave Me and that sort of coincided with the election. And now that both of those are over, I will be taking a step back again, not because the election is sort of emblematic of the way discourse happens. I think we lose something when we lose real world, real world discourse, discourse. There's something about sitting face to face with somebody and, in, and disagreeing with them and being able to kind of have it out in a civil manner that seems to disappear when people are kind of you know, detached from their human selves. So. Well, I know that I, I like face to face. Uh, I enjoy sitting and talking with you guys today and I'd love to continue doing that. Of course, you all have places to be. It's the Miami Book Fair. You're busy authors. But I thank you so much for joining us. Gail Foreman is off, who's the author of Leave Me. I love your cover. It is really cool. It's really pretty. Yeah. And Emily Giffen, whose new book is First Comes Love. I hope you guys have a wonderful Miami Book Fair. And thank you so much for making time for Book View Now. Thank really you, appreciate Rich. it. Thank I'm you. coming all the way over. Thank you so Book much. Bookends of my yeah. that, That's right. With you. I feel like a, what a privilege <laughs> and an honor for that.